Good evening. My name is Erica Witt. I am the interim circulation librarian here at Southern University at New Orleans in New Orleans, Louisiana. Tonight, I have Kalamu Salam, who is a writer as well as a scholar here in the city of New Orleans. And we'll be talking about New Orleans culture, African Americans in New Orleans who have uh, contributed, of course, to African American poetry, as well as talking a bit about the book here, African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle and Song, which is an anthology edited by Kevin Young. And we do also have the book, I Am New Orleans, edited by Kalamu Salam here, which features African American poets in New Orleans. Thank you for joining me. I'm glad to be here. Do you want to just introduce yourself, what you do in the city? My name is Kalamu Yasalam. I was born Valerie Ferdinand III. I'm out of the Mighty Nine, Lower Nine at that. We don't mind dying. We take names, you know what I'm saying? And um, Rivers Frederick Junior High School was where Kalamu became Kalamu before he was named Kalamu. Because there, in seventh grade, I got involved in photography with Mr. Conrad, saved up my money. My first camera was the Yashika Twin Lens Reflex. Mm. And uh, he taught us everything from taking pictures to working in the darkroom and the printing pictures. And photography was my first love. Okay. I don't know who your, or what your first love was, but you know, you've even after subsequent loves, mm. every now and then, it crossed your mind, doesn't it? That's right. <laughs> there you go. So photography was my first love. Okay. Seventh grade. They used to call me the picture man. I'd, I'd walk around, take picture of a flying cockroach, <laughs> catch him in mid-flight, you know what I'm saying? But uh, I'm sitting in the English class in eighth grade one day, and the teacher, who was Mrs. O.E. Nelson, says, put your books away. I want you to hear something. When she said, put your books away, I was glad to do it. I didn't like them anxious. Mm. Put, put the book under the desk. You know, you used to have them desk with the, where you could put the push books up underneath. underneath. Yeah. yeah, push them up underneath. Had them up there. And I'm sitting there, you know, grinning like a chess eye cat. I ain't got to do no <laughs> English today. I ain't got, you know. And Mrs. Nelson pulled out portable record player put a recording on. It was Langston Hughes doing his music, doing his poetry with a jazz piano player behind him. Mm. And the last line of one poem, it got to me. The last line was, well, this was a poem about a woman who was going around Harlem begging for money to bury her husband who died suddenly. Mm. The last lines of the poem a poor man ain't got no business to die. I went to the library and asked the librarian, I want a book by Langston Hughes. The librarian told me where to find Langston Hughes. I get there and Langston Hughes is, yay, long, got books on this, that, and the other. Mm. I said, damn, man got two autobiographies. <laughs> the Big C and I wonder as I wander. I said, well, I guess that's where I got to do it because I, I sure like that poem. And I started reading Langston Hughes, The Weary Blues, from The Weary Blues. To, he had two books of African, uh, of literature by African writers, African Treasure and uh, Black Poems from Africa. There was no better writer in the world for me than Langston Hughes because he was grounded in the blues, but he wrote about everything and he traveled all around the world. Okay. I mean, he traveled literally all around the world. Plus he was an activist. Scottsboro Boys, I don't know if you know about that famous uh, uh, rape trial, he was involved in that. But deeper than that, he was a correspondent during the Spanish Civil War he went to Spain and was a war correspondent. And at that time, he became close 
to quote unquote a great American writer by the name of Ernest Hemingway. They spent the whole afternoon together, just the two of them. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, Langston Hughes was deep. So Langston Hughes, I can't say he, say he said a high boy. You, you, I can't even reach up that. You know, I mean, give me a big stick. I still can't get up there. <laughs> but I had, I was inspired by Langston Hughes, and so from there is how I got into understanding writing as part of. You don't just do your own work. You do you do anthologies. You encourage other writers. You know, I mean, he has letters. Where, where people in South Africa write to him and he encourages them and then does books with featuring their work and so forth and so on. Absolutely. And that, to me, that's what being a writer meant. Mm. You didn't just do one thing. You tried to put your arms around as much as you could carry. And depending upon, you know, what your strength was, was, you know, what you could carry. And you didn't do it. How can I put this? You were open to all kinds of influences, but you never stopped being yourself. Mm. And so he was, Langston Hughes was open to a bunch of Russian writers, Chinese writers. He introduced me to so much, you understand what I'm saying? But he never stopped being Langston Hughes. Right. And that's, and that's, so that became my touchstone. And to this day, I'm all still finding out stuff that Langston Hughes did that amazed me. And I say, I wish I could reach that high, but you got to give me a stick. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I appreciate about your, your writing, your poetry, as well as I Am New Orleans, your edited book that you just published, <laughs> similarly to the um, African American poetry book uh, published by Kevin Young, is the fact that you all give a space for people who otherwise would have either been forgotten or overlooked, maybe not in their communities, but on a national level. Well, let me put it to you this way. We in New Orleans represent those who understood writing as a collective experience and not just an individual experience mm -hmm. to represent our cultures and our heritage. So much so that the first anthology of poetry of African descent, of African heritage descent, comes from New Orleans, mm. 1845. You hear me? 1845, less than now. We come by this. We understand this. We also understand feminism before feminism was termed feminism by somebody by the name of Alice Dunbar Nelson. Mm. Her work is not as prominently displayed as Paul Lawrence Dunbar, her former husband. Why do you think that is? Because we haven't done it. I mean, we got, it's, it's up to us. You know, if you ask um, anybody, why is their work, if you ask somebody of Italian descent, why, why more work is not done, Everybody know the Godfather. Is, is, is that all y'all did and so forth and so on? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They're not going to, they can't disown that, but they has, there's much more to their culture. Right. And I'm saying that's for us to do. That's why we did I Am New Orleans. That's based on a poem that was um, about 1968 or thereabouts. Marcus Christian put that together. And it encompasses the whole concept of what it means to be a New Orleanian. And anybody, when they get the anthology, they, they can see it because that's the lead poem in there. And all the rest of us, the other 35 of us as poets in there, um, we can write our little piece of the corner, but we don't cover the whole block like he does. Mm. Inside the anthology, we don't see a poet, notable poet from New Orleans, Tom Dent. Mm -hmm. Can you be able to speak more on who he is and his poetry? Tom Dent was the son of Albert Dent. Albert Dent was the president of Dillon University. Okay. 
And uh, Tom's mother was a concert pianist. Do that stuff. And um, Tom went to Morehouse as a writer. And then he went up to Syracuse University. That's where he met Jim Brown. You know. Okay. Yeah. Look out now. And he was interested in international relationships and all that kind of stuff. And that's what he was going to major in. And uh, there was a situation that developed while he was in New York. He was, went after his uh, grad school. He went to New York. And um, there were some situations that happened there. But he was working with uh, On Guard for Freedom and all those kind of people up there in New, in New York. And he came home for a minute. And when he came home, there was a happy convergence which I don't think he saw as a happy convergence at the time. It just was happening. But when he came home for a minute, he was not intending to stay in New Orleans. He was going to go back to New York, right? It just so happens at the time he arrives back home is when the Free Southern Theater had moved from Mississippi to New Orleans. Okay. And Tom became actively involved in the Free Southern Theater. The Free Southern Theater was dormant in 1968. That is, it was not going doing its touring and so forth. It was the dormant in 19, June of 1968 when uh, this boy, uh, 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 Val Ferdinand, comes out of the army, right? And Val Ferdinand's girlfriend at the time told him there, there were three theater groups. Yes, he did. There were three theater groups in, in New Orleans. One of them was the Nat Turner Theater, and that was uh, a writer by the name of Charles Self, and they had a, a play called The Smokers that they were doing. Another was uh, Dashiki Theater. Okay. And the third was Free Southern Theater, which was the oldest of, of that trio. And she thought that I'd be more comfortable or, or would, would have an inclination, let's put it that way, towards the Free Southern Theater. So I go to check out all three of them. A um, friend of mine, a good friend of mine, Viola Calhoun, was working with the Nat Turner Theater. And I didn't know any of the people working with uh, Dashiki Theater, but they didn't have a writing workshop at the time, even though their writer in residence was Norbert Davidson, whom I got to know a little bit later. Not much later, but a little later. And the Free Southern Theater had a writing workshop that Tom Dent ran. Hmm. So I joined, I, I went to Free Southern Theater that summer, and Tom was what I needed. He had traveled, he knew a lot of people, and his reading was amazing. He would always say, I'd tell him about that, about, about, he'd say, yeah, but did you check out this? Mm -hmm. Show me the book on the library in his library, personal library, and I start reading and get into it and so forth. Before you know it, Tom and I are partners. I mean, we've written plays together. We, uh, I used to go to he, he was teaching classes up at um, Mary Holmes College. Mm -hmm. He was up in West Point, Mississippi, and all all kind of place. I go, you know. I go, I'm, I'm learning from him, he's, and his library, and he had introduced me to, to writers and to African people I'd never heard of before and stuff like that, except, you know, some of the things I've read with Langston Hughes, but not like the same, like, and then come to find out, he know James Baldwin, and I used to read, you know, I'd go to Tom's house, James Baldwin's sitting up in there. 
what? They're, yeah, smoking cigarettes and talking shit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but Tom, Tom, so Tom opened, opened the brother up. You know how it is when you get with somebody and you don't know nothing, but you know what you want to try and do, and they know a lot and show you s some stuff. Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody can see about Tom, not to me, not to <laughs> Kalamu. <laughs> you, you know, go, go talk, y'all talk that with somebody else. Mm -hmm. But Tom, you know, Tom taught me, and he opened me up, and he introduced me to people. I mean, I'm talking about like Kamal Brathway. I wouldn't have met Kamal except Tom int introducing me to, you know, to, the, to that literature and everything. And Tom, he did some fiction, but not a whole lot. Okay. And he really didn't do a whole lot of poetry. He did some excellent things, two books, uh, Blue Lights and um, Magnolia, Street. Magnolia Street was the other book short book of poems and so forth. And it wasn't until much later that I found out that Tom wrote every day. His output of writing journals and so much work, they got nine linear feet of his work in the Amistad. But he didn't get much published. He didn't get a whole lot published. Why do you think that is? One, he wasn't totally satisfied with a lot of the stuff he was working on because he, he wanted it to be better. And um, I think what Tom did in some of his work exemplifies his understanding and his tussles, as the old folks would say, with the human expression people of African heritage do here in New Orleans. Okay. And to the extent that there's something identifiable in New Orleans, Tom is going to be all over that. I know they got, what is it, minestrone? Yeah. Uh-huh. I know they got chicken noodle. Uh-huh. Y'all got some gumbo? <laughs> so when you ask me about Tom, Tom's some gumbo. Okay. And does that mean it's not soup? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's food. It's, you know, it's a liquid-based food. Well, it's got a flavor of its own. Thank you so much from yeah. the top, bottom, all corners, and ventricles of my heart. Look out now. <laughs> she got me in the ventricles. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, for being a part of this process, for being a part of the movement, for everything that you've given to not only New Orleans, but the nation and even the world, too. So what, what, what did they want to know about? <laughs> right. <laughs> it don't matter. <laughs> Told him what you what you going to tell. That's right. <laughs> my my grandfather was a preacher, and he told me one time. He said, "When you got something to say to a congregation, here's what you're supposed to do. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Then tell them. And after you tell them." <laughs> Tell them what you told them. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I got you. Just so they can remember what you told them. That's right. Mm -hmm. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Mm. All right, now. Peace out, y'all. And if that don't work, we'll go to war, bye. <laughs> <laughs>